It all started with a question. This is me, 20 years ago, a young biochemist at a fine academic institution in the Pacific Northwest. And you see, I had more than a head full of hair. I also had a heart full of ambition. I wanted to know what it's like to be successful. I wanted to know what it takes to be successful. That was my question. How does a scientist succeed? So I asked my colleagues, and I essentially got one answer from all of them, and it was a descriptive one. And they described what I have come to know to be called the academic wheel, which goes like this. You get some grant money, you do some research, and then you publish that research so that you can get more grant money to do more research, and then publish that research, and on and on. Like I said, a descriptive process. But what about success? How does a scientist succeed? I thought about the scientists who I thought were successful. I thought about them, the ones who had inspired me when I was studying. Albert Einstein, Linus Pauling, Watson and Crick. What about them? What made them successful? What do they have? And what about the millions of other scientists who devote their lives and their work and all their passion into moving our truth forward, to increasing our collective knowledge of truth? How do they succeed? Because you see, this academic wheel is a very competitive one. So I thought about this notion of science as moving truth forward. And I thought that a scientist's work is not done until his or her findings are actually accepted as truth, as moving truth forward. Typically, how this is done today is through publications. A scientist has some findings, and they will submit those findings to the most prominent journal that they feel like they have access to with the, with the caliber of their findings, and hope that these prominent journals will then broadcast their findings to the widest community of scientists that are available in hopes that they will then consume this information, validate it, and shepherd it into being truth. So a scientist's work is not really done until his or her findings are all the way into truth. And the publications here, the prominent ones, achieve and maintain their prominence by limiting the number of publications, the, the number of findings that they accept to be true. And so you've got uh, this big problem. You've got this bottleneck. You've got millions of scientists with doing amazing work, all trying to publish in the most prominent journals. But that's not even it. There was a more fundamental gap for me. There is a gap, gap between findings and truth. And it's actually not the publishers who sit be, uh, within that gap. It's, in fact, the community of scientists themselves. People. People like you and me. These are sentient beings driven by their self-identity, their personalities, their likes and dislike, uh, dislikes, their upbringing, who their friends were, their emotions, what they choose to believe, what they choose to reject, sentient beings. That's who sits between facts and truth. And so in order for a scientist to shepherd those findings from fact to truth, they need to gain both logical or intellectual and emotional acceptance of their ideas. You see, that's where the true gap is. Because you're dealing with people who are evaluating science. So the most logical place to go with this is storytelling. I'm sure you've heard a thing or two about storytelling these days. It's all a buzz in fields like marketing and education and even science. There's lots of talks about how science needs to be better storytellers. But going back to success, is that what it takes to be successful, to be a better storytelling, uh, be a better storyteller? You see, this gap between findings and truth is actually a very necessary gap. And the scientists who occupy this gap are, in fact, the gatekeepers of what we collectively believe to be the truth. And so better storytellers would then 
shepherd their findings to be more true, and what if they're wrong? Let me tell you a story. <laughs> so, in the early 1950s, two young and very hungry scientists in Oxford, Cambridge, uh, in Oxford, England, were racing to solve the structure of the DNA molecule, Watson and Crick. They had this great urgency because there was another scientist in, the, in America who was also after the same pursuit, Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling was a master storyteller. He had very recently demonstrated the power of communications, his power of communications, when several years before he had elucidated the structure of proteins, the other great biological molecule. And the way he had done it was not just to publish his findings in the widest journal, no, 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 no. He had dropped a massive body of knowledge onto the scientific community overnight. He published it in a series of seven papers, demonstrating authority. He was a master storyteller. He also had a theory about the DNA molecule, and it turns out actually that it was wrong. So you see this gap that's between findings and truth is actually a necessary one, and the scientists who occupy that gap, even though they are sentient beings driven by their emotions and biases, are actually necessarily sitting there in order to protect us from believing the wrong things. And so storytelling can't just be the answer for what makes us successful. I'm no longer in the lab. I'm now a marketer. And I work with companies and organizations that want to communicate and persuade scientists. And through my work, as well as through research, I've come to find that scientists take in information and make decisions mirroring the scientific process itself. So the way the scientific process works and the way science is today communicated is essentially what you see here. You start with a hypothesis and then you validate that hypothesis and you demonstrate the validation through data. That's about it. You make an observation, you formulate a hypothesis about it, and then you generate enough evidence or data in order to validate it. And this is how science is done and this is how science is communicated. It all makes a lot of sense because scientists also have this innate ability to go back and forth between curiosity and skepticism very well. Curiosity is what enables a scientist to make a novel observation. Skepticism keeps him or her from believing the first thing that they see until they prove it to themselves. And once they do that, they package that information and they put it out for the, to the world to consume. Makes all kinds of sense, doesn't it? It's very logical. And in fact, it does gain intellectual acceptance in the marketplace. But as I said before, there's an emotional component to this. And so what I discovered when I actually ventured onto the emotional realm for a scientist, I found something amazing. I found the spark, what I believe to be the spark in science. And that's what's missing. It's not talked about today, and it's also not communicated in the sciences. It's creativity. You see, when a scientist makes an observation in their curiosity mode, and they emotionally resonate with it, there's an emotional reaction to that observation. There's a burst of creativity. That is the fuel that takes the scientist all the way through the treacherous path and all the daily failures until they validate that hypothesis. That's the motivation for a scientist. That's where it starts. The academic wheel has nothing to do with this. Science is a creative endeavor. Scientists are very creative, and we never talk about that. I believe that in order for a scientist to tell a good story, in order to capture the emotional acceptance of their findings in the, in the community, is to start with that creativity. It's to actually inspire that same creativity in their audiences. It all starts there. Now, there's a filter also, the fourth quadrant on this graph, 
Uh, we all have it. Scientists have it too. Um, it's essentially keeps them from interacting with information that they seem to be worthless or biased or for any, for any reason or no reason at all because it is an emotional reaction. And so as a storyteller, we want to stay away from that quadrant. But the rest of it, the flow of the stories that uh, I believe that scientists need to tell in order to gain acceptance starts with that creativity. Then you move to the logical realm and provide the hypothesis and the validation. I believe that in order for more scientists to be successful, they need to take an active role on shepherding their findings to gain both emotional and intellectual acceptance into truth using this flow of stories by providing first that burst of creativity and then providing the hypothesis and the validations. And you know, my hope is that more scientists do succeed because then we'll be living in a world where decisions are made on beliefs that are grounded in more truth. And so as, as I said at the very beginning, it all started with a question. And as it often happens in the world of science, it leads to new questions. So I leave you with this last question. How do we get the truth to succeed? Thank you. <laughs>